Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I am hoping that this video doesn't seem like me gloating because my intention is not to gloat, but I do want to celebrate and I want to share that celebration with my viewers. So on October 18th, I released an open letter to Jeremy Crawford. I tweeted it, I made a video where I read it out loud, and honestly, I wasn't sure what the response would be. Would it even be read? Would any of the suggestions and requests I made be considered? Would the community, the D&D community, would they support the letter? Or would they think I was being presumptuous? Well, I can say almost two months later that yes, it was a bit of all of that. 99% of my viewers, like always, were fantastic. You folks are friggin' awesome. Thank you to everyone who retweeted the letter, but also I can't say how much I appreciate your words of support in the comments section. Yeah, YouTube has a reputation for crap shows in the comments, but my viewers are almost without exception supportive, and when I see comments like this, I just want you to know it means a lot. But yes, some people in the community, not so much in the video comments on that video, but elsewhere in the community thought I was being presumptuous to think my concerns deserved the personal attention of Jeremy Crawford. Others said I was too negative. Some described the letter as, and I quote, scathing. All I can say is my intention wasn't to be negative or scathing or anything like that. I was just trying to be polite, ask some sincere questions, and yes, to provide some constructive criticism. Now, I have a YouTube channel, and that maybe gives me more of a voice than someone who doesn't have a YouTube channel. But I don't surrender my right to release an open letter to somebody just because I create content. That doesn't happen. I still have that right, just like you have that right. I have opinions, and I'd like to share those opinions. But you know, far more commonly than really negative stuff, I, I saw a lot of comments that the letter was too long. And there was no way anyone in the design team was going to read such a long letter or watch such a long video of me reading the letter. And that is a fair critique. When I wrote the letter, I honestly didn't know whether I was going to do anything with it other than exercise some self-therapy, just getting out some of my anxiety over the process of writing it. And you know what? I'll admit, I mean, you if you are here and you watch my videos, you know I can be long-winded, and apparently I can be long-lettered as well. Uh, so, yeah, maybe it should have gone through a more rigorous editing process. That's fair enough. Now, I want to protect the anonymity of a colleague who sent me a private message, but I will share the message itself. So here was the original message. I don't think this open letter is a good idea personally. And so I responded, what are your concerns about it? And I won't share the entire conversation, but here's the relevant part. They said, if they wanted deep stuff from influencers, then they would ask us personally. Keep in mind, these 15 people, or how many are working on this book, are all pretty much confident millionaire game designers who's making the world's greatest role-playing game to be even greater were nobodies. So there you have it, folks. If you want to get rich, get into tabletop role-playing game design. I gotta say, I don't think anybody is getting rich on the D&D design team. But the main point they're making here is that the letter was pointless because the designers don't care. So do they care? Did they even bother to read the letter? They haven't sent me an email saying that, yes, we read your letter, but I think they did. I think they read it, and I think they thought some of my questions were worth answering, and some of my suggestions were worth using. Now, before I go forward, it is possible that everything I'm going to show you is a coincidence. I'm certainly not the only person to ever ask these questions or make these observations, but here's how the rest of the video is going to go. I did that video where I read the letter, so I'll play a clip of that, then I'll show you how I think it got a response and what that response was. And yes, potentially all a coincidence, but I don't think so. When I see Eldritch Blast excluded from the spell lists, does it mean it's going to be a Warlock class feature instead? Are you removing it from the game? Or was it just an omission or a mistake? So that is a great question. And what I think is important to understand about the play test is we're presenting a version of something and 
asking what people think of it with the assumption that if something doesn't appear in the playtest, it's still in the game. So people have rightly noticed that the Eldritch Blast spell has not appeared on any of the spell lists thus far. Eldritch Blast has not been removed from the game. It thank, just simply means <laughs> it just means it's not on those spell lists. Uh, and when we get to the Mage Unearthed Arcana, people will get to see what we're doing with Eldritch Blast in the Warlock. Speaking of confusion regarding the surveys, I know I would appreciate it, and I expect many players would as well. Could we get a clarification? Are our answers assuming we've actually tried these new options? Or do you just want our impressions after reading them? And it's even valuable to us if, say, a, a person doesn't have time to play test, it's still valuable for us to get feedback on the survey just based on the person's reading of the material. Uh, because we, we can tell when we're reading if feedback is based on real play experience versus first impression on reading, feedback from both situations is mm. helpful to us. Also, are you getting rid of the use an object action? Because we sure noticed it was missing from the thief's fast hand feature. If you're getting rid of it, fine, but if you're not, we would sure like to know why it was removed. Now, people have, have rightly noticed that uh, the thief subclass in the previous UA doesn't, as a part of their cunning action enhancement, interact with the use an object action anymore. That's intentional. Uh, that wasn't an accidental omission. Uh, we removed it from that feature because in the 2014 version of the feature, it fell into an area of mechanics that we sometimes refer to as mother may I mechanics. Mm. And what we mean by that is something that is on your character sheet that really only works if the DM cooperates with you in its execution. Might the use an object action go away? It might. I'll, I'll be upfront about that. Uh, but we haven't decided yet. And that will be a decision we come to through the playtest process. We're also already finding that our fifth edition source books aren't fully compatible. For example, if you want to play an Eloquence Bard, I don't get features at the same levels, and I don't get as many features overall. Am I supposed to change the levels they're gained at? Which feature goes with which level? What about only getting three features? Am I supposed to add something? What about the features that don't work anymore? I mean, a simple fix could be done for unfailing inspiration by just not expending the bardic inspiration. But what about infectious inspiration? That doesn't work at all with the new way that inspiration uses your reaction instead of giving out a die to hold on to. And so I read the Cleric and Revised Species document and I noticed they added something under subclasses. It says, In some cases, you might find an older subclass doesn't fully work with the features in the playtest version of a class. If we publish the new version of the class, we'll resolve that discrepancy. Great. Let's move on. The sharpshooter feat obviously looks similar to the way it used to, other than it giving us a plus one to dexterity. But the one change that was made seems very dramatic. The minus five to hit in order to get plus ten damage was changed to the ability to fire a ranged weapon within five feet of an enemy without having disadvantage. I assume you already knew this was going to be a jarring change to players reading this document for the first time. Because we don't know what your design goals are, we're not discussing these changes in ways that are going to be productive to you. We're instead discussing our wild speculations as to why you made this change. Here's the issue. First off, the penalty to the two hit roll, especially at higher levels, is not actually big enough to justify that large of a damage bonus. Uh, it becomes very easy as you progress to make that minus five to your attack roll trivial. Maybe you want weapons to do less damage. We want you to go to feats because there's a particular angle you want to accentuate, not because you feel like I've got to take this feat to even be able to show up and do my job. So fear not, uh, people who love playing uh, warriors, there is juicy stuff coming in the classes themselves. 
And that's where we want you to be able to turn reliably to some options where you will be dishing out the damage. Should we expect weapon properties other than the light weapon property to have new and exciting mechanics? Is the warrior playtest going to build on these options? So when, again, we get to uh, the warrior classes and we explore the new weapon options, we're also going to explore possibly tweaking some of the other weapon properties. But our focus is going to be more on these brand new options. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about that in the months ahead. At this time, we don't even know if there will be higher level feats than fourth level. If you put even a couple sentences that said something like, in future playtests, you'll see higher level feats that build on these options. Weapons will be able to do things they never have before. And your high level weapon using character will feel more impactful than they ever have before, regardless of the weapon type you chose to specialize in. We want our warrior classes in particular to be able to rely on their class features, which remember are going to include some of these awesome new weapon options. We want them to be able to rely on those for their main damage output. We want you to go to feats because there's a particular angle you want to accentuate, not because you feel like I've got to take this feat to even be able to show up and do my job. What gives with spell selection? You have these three lists, and my character choosing spells needs to go through this big list and then search for spells of specific schools to know which ones they can prepare. Rather than us taking the time to do that, you could just print the available list for each spellcasting class. By all means, tell us the mechanics of which category of spells and which school of spells the list comes from. Then when you release new products, we know what spells are available to our character. But for the player's handbook at least, print the list of available spells to each spellcasting class, just like our 5th edition player's handbooks. So it's going to be a class-by-class -class decision we make, and it will really come down to, is it too much of a headache to go through the list and then manually as a player exclude certain right, schools? Yeah. And I could definitely see that being a pain, in which case we are likely to give that class its own list that, again, is really just a summary of what's available to them from the master list. But then if a class like the cleric or the wizard can choose from an entire list, there'll be no need for us to have a class-specific list for them. And when a survey asks us if we're satisfied with that change, there's no way to tell you that, really, it depends. Now, I recognize that I can add additional comments, but realistically, I know you can't possibly read all the comments from thousands upon thousands. We have multiple members of our design team dedicated to going through survey responses. And so that, that is your direct conduit to our design team. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. But these next two bits, they're going to be a little bit embarrassing for me, especially the second one. I'm about to eat some humble pie. There is a similar confusion with a light weapon property. When you take the attack action on your turn and attack with a light weapon in one hand, you can make one extra attack as part of the same action. That extra attack must be made with a different light weapon in the other hand. Does when you take the attack action mean that the different light weapon needs to be in the other hand when you make the first attack? Or can you equip it after the first attack has been made? I'm not sure what you mean and players I've spoken to aren't sure either. They sometimes ask me which way it should be read, and I don't know what to tell them. Some simple changes in how the sentence is structured could make it clear how this is supposed to work, whichever of those two it's supposed to be. You're communicating entirely new rules to us here, and it seems like the communication could be clearer yet than what we're seeing so far. So what I was talking about was the light weapon property as it appeared in the expert classes playtest, and it says, when you take the attack action on your turn and attack with a light weapon in one hand, you can make one extra attack as part of the same action. And then, period. That extra attack must be made with a different light weapon in the other hand. When you read this, it's not clear whether that extra attack made with a different light weapon in the other hand needs to be in your hand when you make the initial attack. The reason this even matters is it is relevant when one of those weapons is a hand crossbow 
that needs the other hand free to reload it. Because if it doesn't, then you can do this silly weapons juggling thing to get around it. So here's the version we got with the cleric and revised species document. So you can see the wording has been changed so that the intention is now 100% clear. When you take the attack action on your turn and attack with a light weapon in one hand and have a light weapon in the other hand, you can make one extra attack as part of the same action. 100% clear now. You must have both weapons in your hands when you make the attack action in order to get this benefit. Now, here's the embarrassing part. I asked for this change in that letter. And then they made the change that I was asking for, and I missed it. I did a video where I go through the changes, all the changes that I found to the rules in the Cleric and Revised Species playtest, and I don't even notice that one of the changes I asked for is there. So it's not in the video. But wait, that's not even the most embarrassing one. Sometimes the words you choose leave us guessing. For example, in the expert classes playtest, we see an important change to the attack action. Under equipping weapons, it says, you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after any attack you make as part of this action. If you are unaware, there is a debate whether this means you can equip or unequip a weapon before any single attack or each attack. This confusion seems avoidable to me. If you mean before a single attack, then it could read, you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after a single attack made as part of this action. If you mean before each attack, then it could read, you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after each attack made as part of this action. Clear language would mean clearer understanding. So check this out. They took my suggestion. Exactly. If you mean before each attack, then it could read, you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after each attack made as part of this action. Clear language would mean clearer understanding. And that is amazing. And here's how I thank them for that. Now I notice on the change log, they say the attack action has been changed. It says equipping weapons section. So the equipping weapons section was supposedly changed, but I don't see the change. So I'm just gonna go down to the attack action. And equipping weapons, here it is. It says, you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after each attack you make as part of this action, even if the attack is with an unarmed strike. Well, here is the expert classes playtest document. Let me just move it over. There we are, equipping weapons. You can equip or unequip one weapon before or after any attack you make as part of this action, even if the attack is with an unarmed strike. I think that's word for word. So I'm not sure if they intended there to be a change and uh, just, you know, forgot about it or uh, there was a, some kind of file error or cut and paste error or something. So I am so sorry to my viewers and to Jeremy Crawford and the design team. I don't know how I missed this. Actually, I do. I think I didn't think that any of my suggestions would be taken. So I just didn't expect this to be here. But it's here, so thank you. I know it's a late thank you, sorry about that, but thank you. Oh, and if you read the rest of the letter, you'll know my main ask of the whole thing was, could Jeremy Crawford please start to share the design goals of 1D&D? Now I considered putting a bunch of clips together right here of Jeremy Crawford sharing the design goals of 1D&D, but that would be a lot of clips. But I will summarize. They want to move classes to third level, mainly to make first level easier for players not familiar with all the subclass options and allow them to make that important selection after they've gotten some experience playing the base class. They also want to require more investment through multi-classing to access those subclass features. They want to move away from mechanics that cause designers to distort design decisions elsewhere to have things work with them. The example he gives is the light weapon property allowing fighting with two weapons without using your bonus action which created, and I quote, bad interactions with other mechanics that required your bonus action. They want options in each class to be as friction-free as possible in regards to the ease of selection. They want the warrior classes to be able to, quote, rely on their class features for their main damage output. They want to eliminate, quote, must-have feats. Oh, and in regards to feats and damage, I swear he said this, 
And I quote, We do not want you to feel like you need to take particular feats to reach a baseline. Seriously, he said baseline. Now, he added in regards to damage or other things, but baseline damage, you say? I've heard that somewhere before. Okay, I said I didn't want this video to be gloating. That was a little bit of gloating right there. He also said the plan is for warriors to be able to do things with particular weapons beyond just doing damage. That is fantastic. And finally, I love this game. I love the game we've all been playing together for uh, the last eight years. But there are also things that I know could be faster, have more options, be clearer, uh, you know, have fewer places where you feel forced to make certain decisions. And so we're now able to address all of that. Now, just to be clear, I didn't get like an email or a tweet saying anyone had read my letter, but I think you can see why I think it got read. I think they thought I asked questions worthy of being answered and requests worthy of being considered. So based on my belief, I would like to sincerely thank Jeremy Crawford mainly, but also Todd Kendrick and the D&D design team and anyone else who was involved in getting the words of my letter to Jeremy Crawford. You have made this a great week uh, for me and I hope for other players of D&D who we all want to contribute in any way we can to make the best version of one D&D possible. I don't expect perfection. I don't even expect every design goal to be achieved. I don't think those would be reasonable expectations, but knowing what the design goals are, it's just massively reassuring. And when I fill out surveys, now I know how those survey results are taken, and I know so much more about the context when I make an answer. I want to thank all my viewers as well for sharing and boosting the visibility of the letter and for watching this video. Until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.